Uh, we are going to touch up, so what I'm going to try to do is get some cool little blue tape. And I need people that can go by and pull out staples or uh, some nails, depends on where they're at, and then mark any blemishes with blue tape and then have the crew come behind them and touch that up. So if we, can, if we have enough people to break down a crew into that and then the painting and the cleanup, uh, we should roll through it pretty quick. So, um, so back to tonight. Again, take a minute, clear your mind, clear your thought, clear your heart. Uh, this is God doing business with us one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it's just, we had church this morning, it was a good time. Are we ready to get church again tonight? Are we ready to hear the Word of God speak to our heart? And tonight, we have my favorite Sunday school teacher in my life, I think. Because I haven't had a Sunday school teacher forever. But uh, uh, Brother Butler is going to come and preach for us tonight. Amen. All right, let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 8. I have been accused of preaching almost exclusively out of the Old Testament, and I don't really have an answer to that. I, I guess it's just I kind of gravitate toward that, I guess. But uh, we'll be in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Last few messages I've done, I know I've been in the Old Testament. Um, but I do love the book of Deuteronomy. I've talked with some men of our church. Um, I believe Sean was, was one of them. We're just talking about how much, the, how much is contained in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, just a great book. So we um, touch in here, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10 is where we'll start, and we'll go through the end of the chapter. So let's go ahead and get into the Bible here. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 10. When thou hast eaten and art full, then shalt thou bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest, when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water." who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that, hath given thee, that giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them. I testify against you this day, that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for your word, and Lord, I, I pray that you be with us this day, um, tonight, as we, as we look here at a, a small passage of your word. I pray that the truths found here um, speak to us. I pray that I be able to, um, to, uh, to impart these truths or to um, preach these truths in a, in a clear and, and concise manner, Lord. I pray that uh, your word speak to hearts Lord, I pray that you fill me with your spirit, that I say only what you would have me to say. And Lord, I pray that you be with each and every need in here, whether it be a need of salvation or, or, or what it, whatever it might be, or all the needs that are represented here in this room tonight. I pray that you meet each one. And Lord, draw us closer to you. Help us to leave here closer to you than how we came in. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We see in our text here, um, a passage that is filled with warnings and with exhortations. And it really is um, almost a snapshot of the rest of the book of Deuteronomy, um, especially to the first 11 
chapters, um, you see a lot of warnings given. You see exhortations given, commands given. Um, you see, of course, the, from chapter 12 on, um, it, or not through the rest of the chapter, but a large portion, or not through the rest of the book, a large portion of the book will deal with the commands that God has for his children. But in our text, like I said, we see some warnings, we see some exhortations. Moses, here in our text, warns against a great danger that they will face when God has brought them into the promised land where they have conquered the nations that are there and they are living in those cities. And if you look at verses 7 through 10, you see all the good things that are there that they will have at their disposal when they have conquered the promised land. And so Moses here is warning them of, of a great danger that will come. And this danger is not from an outside source. It is not from an army or from a great walled city like Jericho. Instead, it is a source that is an internal source of danger. And that is spiritual amnesia, the forgetting of God. Now, this is something that Moses warned, ag uh, warned against uh, several times in this book. And hundreds of years later, you would see... The prophet Hosea, near the end of the reign of uh, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, he would make the sad proclamation that Israel hath forgotten his maker. So the warning sometime, and you see it numerous times if you study the history of Israel, they would forget their maker. And so it's something that they, we see present in their, in their history, and it's something I think we need to be mindful of in our life that we not forget God. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. The reason for this is found in verse 19. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods. Because really, the instant we forget God, we're serving another God. There's no other option. If we are not mindful of God, and if we, or if we forget God, we instantly start, start serving other gods. What's the result of that? If we walk after them and serve them and worship them, them we will perish. Just, and God tells Israel, just like the nations that were in the land before you, which you are getting ready to conquer, I am getting ready to drive them out before you. But if you forget me, you're going to be driven out just like they were. So it's a very, very important passage here for Israel. It's an important passage for us. There are, not only can a nation forget God, again, individuals can forget God. Numerous examples I think we would see in the Bible. I think Solomon being, it would be an extremely prominent one. How we see early in his reign, he loved God. He loved the Lord his God, the Bible said. But what happened? His heart got turned away. He loved something else. And he forgot about God getting to the point, of course, we saw throughout some of his life where he was trying to find purpose in life outside of God. That, of course, is recounted in, his, in the book of Ecclesiastes as pastor went through. So spiritual amnesia is an extreme danger to us. And here we see some helps for us in this passage regarding spiritual amnesia. So our, what we'll look at today is three things concerning this forgetting of God or concerning spiritual amnesia. We'll look, first of all, at the snares of forgetting God or the danger that comes when we do forget God. The source of forgetting God. Where does this forgetfulness come from? And then the stain or the stopping of forgetting God, making sure that we do not forget our God. So let's look, first of all, here at the snares of forgetting God. Two dangers that we'll find here in our text that Moses gives us that a forgetfulness of God will bring. And that is, spiritual amnesia will cause us to forget the purpose of trials and the purpose of blessings. Both of them. If we forget God, we will not have an accurate um, recognition of the purpose of a trial or the purpose of God's blessings in our life. A misinterpretation of either of these can lead to ruin in a Christian life. We think of oftentimes of how a, a, if you misinterpret a trial or if you don't understand the purpose of a trial or why God is doing something, we would understand how that could lead to our ruin. But the, misinterpreting the purpose of a blessing 
is just as dangerous. There's danger in prosperity. Different portions of the Bible would touch on that. So these, let's look at these two dangers, these two snares that come when we forget God. Verses 15 and 16 here in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. The danger of forgetting the purpose of trials here. Or somehow we will forget the purpose of trials when we forget God. We are in grave danger. Again, we are in grave, grave danger of falling when we forget why a trial is given. Moses gives the reason for the trials that Israel had faced up until this point, And he lists some of them here. Of course, we also see God's blessing and God's um, support for Israel through that time as well. But verse 16 tells us why God put them through those trials that to humble them and to prove them for the express purpose of doing them good at thy latter end. To do thee good. It would do, <laughs> I know it would do me, it would do a lot of us good to have a little humility, a little bit more humility in our life, to humble us. But think about what ha is happening to, this, to these Israelites in this case. They're just about to enter the promised land. Which means that the generation he is speaking to outside of, of course, Joshua and Caleb, their entire life, primarily at least, has been wandering in a desert. Forty years. So the Bible says, of course, when we, we know from Kadesh, when Kadesh Barnea, when they rebelled against God, anybody 20 years old and upward would not come into the land, of course, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. So that means you could have someone who is 59 years old, who 40 years of his life, two-thirds of his life, he's just been wandering around. What purpose is that? What purpose is a life of just wandering around? Not buying a home, can't buy a home. They're, they're just uprooting their tents and moving whenever the cloud would move. And so think of that, 40 years of doing this. We get tired, you know, people get into a job and, and they're, you know, they, they do well at the job for two years and they start getting bored. Now, what can I do next? There's no other option. 40 years going in the wilderness. No other option. So the question had to come up, why are we doing this? You understand the reason. Again, we can, we can, we can get into a purpose. We're into a trial, and we understand biblically, yeah, God's bringing us, you know, when, I'm, when he tried me, I shall come forth as gold. We know all the answers. We know the verses. But it doesn't stop the questions from coming. Why, why is this happening? Why is this happening to us, to me? And again, the Bible has the answers. The verses that we know, the verses that we can quote, they contain what we need to make it through the trial. But the purpose that, of any trial that God puts us through is to do us good, to help us, to benefit us. It doesn't help God out. He's not doing it for his benefit. He's doing it for our benefit. And we can see the effect that it had on this generation of the Israelites. Think about when they came into the promised land, they conquered Jericho, the first city that they conquered. And God had said, that is mine. Any loot, any wealth found in that city belongs to me. Basically saying, that's, that's my portion, that's my tithe, if you will, of all your loot that you're going to find. Any other city... You, come, you conquer, you can, you can take uh, the wealth of it. But Jericho is mine. You would take any independent Baptist church of this size, smaller, larger, I guarantee you, you will probably have more than one person disobey. You have hundreds of thousands of Israelites. One person disobeys Achan. That's staggering. Think of how much wealth Jericho would have had. And you have all these soldiers running through the streets, no one to stop them from taking a piece of gold, taking a, a, a prime cow or, or bull. And only one person decides to steal. 
the trials that that generation of Israel had gone through had done them good. It had taught them the importance of obeying God. It had done them good. They did not lose heart like the prior generation did. They conquered the promised land. Yes, we know they failed to drive out some of the inhabitants. But think of just, I was just thought, struck by that thought that only one person would, would try to take loot from Jericho is, is amazing. And it's, it's a great testimony for this generation of Israelites that they had learned the importance of obedience to God. And it was brought about, they learned that through the trials, through the 40 years of wandering in the desert. What are we doing here? We're learning how to obey God. We are learning. We are, it is for our benefit. Of course, as I mentioned, Job learned this. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. The Apostle Paul had to learn the purpose of the thorn in the flesh that he thought was hindering him. But it was actually for his benefit to do him good so that he could glorify God more. But if we have forgotten, the per, the forgotten God, we will not appreciate the purpose of the trial. We will resent the presence of the trial. Saying, why does God put me through this? So when we forget God, we forget the purpose of the trial. To do us good for our benefit. We will also forget the purpose of blessings. Let's talk, look at verse 18 in Deuteronomy here, chapter 8. Verse 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto, us, unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Why does God bless us? He doesn't bless us because he's so glad to have us on our side. And he just wants to, like we're a bunch of mercenaries, that he has to pay better than the other guy. That's not why God blesses us. The sole purpose of any blessing in our life is for us to glorify Him. What does it say here in, our in the verse? It is He that giveth thee power to get wealth. Why? That He may establish His covenant, which He swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. It is the, for the purpose that He could fulfill His covenant so that He could be glorified. That's why He gave the Israelites the ability to conquer the promised land. That's why he was going to give them wealth, to fulfill his covenant to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, so that he would be glorified. And that is the purpose of the blessings in our life, to so that God would be glorified. We can think of Queen Esther. What was the purpose of her queenship? Why did God put her in that specific place? Why did God have her so far removed from the promised land, from, from Israel? Why did God have the king find favor in her? Uh, in her? It's so that he, she could be in that exact spot. Save the Jews, God would be glorified. God would once again thwart another attempt by Satan to wipe out his chosen people. God was glorified through Queen Esther's Queenship. We see the Corinthian church have been blessed greatly. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul implies, telling them that the, the church had been blessed be, so that they could use their blessings in God's service. And Paul asked the question, why, what do you have in your life that you have not received? And if you have received it, why do you then glory? Everything in our life, all the way down to our heartbeat and the breath that we take, has been given to us by God. So why would we think anything we receive is because of us? That somehow it was us. We received it. If we received it, it wasn't our. It wasn't from us. It was from someone else. Breath is from us, is from God. Uh, any blessings we receive, any abilities we have is from God. We can look back at our life and think, well, look at all these things that I've accomplished. No, you may have accomplished it, but you accomplished it through the ability that God gave you. And he put you in those spots to accomplish those things. The purpose of blessings is to glorify God. But 
But if we have forgotten God, how quickly pride will set in. We will forget the purpose of blessings and we'll think, well, God gave this to me or I got this because I'm so, so much of a whiz with money. I can wheel and deal. I can get the best deals on the market. That's my ability. And I got this because I'm so good at it. We forget the purpose of blessings. And it will re- lead to ruin. So what blessings do we have in our life that we've received that has filled us with pride rather than with gratitude and a desire to glorify God for His goodness, for His grace, that He would give us stuff. But when we forget God, we forget the purpose of trials, we forget the purpose of blessings. Next, let's look at the source of forgetting God. How do we start forgetting God? What causes us to forget God? What starts to block off that memory? You know, out of sight, out of mind. As the old saying goes, that's very true. When we lose sight of God, we'll not remember Him. We will forget Him very quickly. This is not a sudden occurrence, this forgetting of God. It happens very incrementally, uh, very insidiously. And our text here gives, again, two reasons, I think, that would cause the Israelites to forget God. Let's look at verses 12 through 14. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. What's the focus on here in verses 12 and 13? It's every, all these material possessions. And again, they were the blessings of God. All, all the things that are mentioned here would be a, for a blessing from God. But because they have forgotten God... Now, they have started to place to overvalue these things, the material goods. The source of forgetting God. Why do we start to forget God? Because we start to value other things. We have misplaced values in our life. Danger of prosperity, again, is the tendency to value material goods or to value physical comfort over the things or the will of God. Or again, we, we assume because we have much, we have been blessed by God. Um, 1 Timothy 6, verse 5, supposing that gain is godliness. Uh, we value gain and say, well, because we have this much, we must have been blessed by God. But the Israelites here, you see verses 12 and 13, again, the, the blessings that God will give, them, give to them. But you also see verse 14. Thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. They would no longer value their salvation. They would no longer value what they were brought from. A physical comfort will change, would change what they valued. Look at the Laodicean church. They thought they were great. We have goods, we have need of nothing. And God said, you don't even know what condition you're actually in. You value the material. You value the temporal. You've forgotten all about God. You have misplaced values. If we value the physical more than the spiritual, then we will forget the things of God. We will start to forget God. Christ is the life of God. Of the Christian, Colossians 3 5, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. But oftentimes we live like something else is the source of our life. We value something else. The, my job is my life. You, you've heard that. I'm sure we've all heard somebody say that. My job is my life. All my effort, all my energy goes into my job. Misplaced values. To put it simply, which do we value more, the physical or the eternal? What do we value more? If we value the physical more, we are on track to forget God. I think that's where it starts. We start to value the material, the things of this world, over the things of God. So misplaced values can lead to 
forgetting God. Also, of course, coming right in line with that is pride. You saw that in verse 14, then thy heart be lifted up. Verse 17, and thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. An inflated view of ourselves is the cause of a lot of sins. This pride and forgetfulness of God, I think, is one of those. Um, Think about the first time we know of when pride occurs, and that is, of course, Lucifer. So you have pride come in with Lucifer, and it seems to make him forget that God is all-powerful. I mean, you're not going to overthrow somebody who is all-powerful. Seems a pretty basic concept, but it seems pride made him forget that concept, that God is all-knowing. You're not going to scheme and use intrigue to overthrow God. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere. I mean, Lucifer knew all that better than we do. But pride crept in, and it seemed to have made him forget this, these things. It seemed to have made him forget some key characteristics of God. And it does the same to us. Pride makes us forget God. We start to think it's our own power, our own might, our own abilities have led to these blessings or led to the point we are in our life. We often claim credit for the good things that have transpired in our life, for the accomplishments that we've done. We think it's by our hand, that our own talents have gotten us there. But again, when we have that view, we forget God. And it's a dangerous, dangerous spot to be in leading us to forget what Christ had to endure to bring us to a place where we can be blessed by God. Source of forgetting God, misplaced values, and of course the pride that will creep in. We all have heard messages on pride. I'm not not going to spend too much time on that. But just think, again, with with Lucifer. It made him forget who God was. And he had a front row seat So what do you think it will do to us? So the stain of forgetting God. How can we stop the forgetting of God? How do we keep God ever foremost in our minds? Again, we see some clues given to us by Moses in our text. Verse 10. When thou thou hast eaten and art full. This is prime territory for the devil to try to get us to forget God. So what's the response? Then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. As we receive blessing after blessing, and we just had testimony time where, where people came up and they acknowledged the blessing of God in their life, which is good. That's why we have that time. So that we can get up and we can acknowledge who the source of those blessings is. But as we receive these blessings, we should constantly acknowledge, again, who is the source and bless him for those blessings. To bless, to kneel, or uh, it's an act of adoration. Thankfulness, but not just a thank you. A little bit more heartfelt than that, a little bit more serious than that. Again, an act of adoration. As we receive the blessings and, and we're full, do we get down on our knees And just go through everything that God has given to us and thank Him and bless Him for that. A constant thankfulness, a constant gratitude will prevent a forgetfulness of God. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Again, when we keep keep this in our our life, the blessing and, and the worshiping of God for all that He has done for us, It will help keep in mind our reliance on Him, that we are wholly reliant on God. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, familiar verses to us. <clears throat> says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when we have that prayer, that thanksgiving in in place in our life, 
as we receive things and as we pray for things. That prayer and supplication, having that thanksgiving, having that act, that act of adoration of God in place, our hearts and minds will be kept through Christ Jesus. And I have news, when Christ is keeping our hearts and minds, we're not forgetting God. Uh, we are definitely not forgetting God. He is going to be foremost in our lives. So when we have that thanksgiving, that blessing of God, the adoration of God in place, our hearts and minds will be kept by Him, and they will also be kept on Him. So how do we stop forgetting God? Bless Him. Worship Him. Thank Him constantly, over and over, every day. Not the, the uh, constant recitation of, oh, thank you, God. Lord, thank you so much for, the, for uh, everything you've done in our lives. You know, I'm guilty of it. We all are uh, guilty of it. Get into the rut. where we're, When we pray, that's what we say. We have these sayings that we do when we pray. And <laughs> every one of us has it, has them. Stop and think about what we're saying. Do we actually mean what we say? And expound on it more. Not just thank you, God, for all you've done. Well, great. How about you list some of the things? I think he would like to be, to hear us think about it. And to acknowledge. Yeah, yeah, I'm the one who, who gave you the money to get that car. And yeah, I'm the one who, who gave you the health for the twin babies to be delivered. I'm the one who gave you that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would like to hear it. God does like to hear specifics. Not these generalities that we so often throw his way. Bless God. And then also beware. Let's look at, back at verse 11 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. How do we stop forgetting God? We bless God and we also need to beware. Verse 11 of Deuteronomy 8. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. Thomas Jefferson said, Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. That is true in the physical world. It's also true in the spiritual world. If we wish to not have our, bond, our members in bondage to sin, then we must have that extreme vigilance. We must constantly beware of the dangers. Moses is exhorting Israel to keep watch. That's what that word, that's the meaning of that word, to keep watch, to, to be on the lookout for these dangers, to keep watch against forgetting God, to be diligent against this threat. When an army would encamp, would they just pitch tents and go to sleep? No, they would set a watch. That took some effort. That took some organization. They would have, if you go to the Civil War time, they would have what's called pickets, sentry line. And you would have layers of pickets. You wouldn't just set up one ring. You'd set up multiple rings around your camp. Multiple centuries. Why would they do that? They were, be, they were being wary of the enemy's attacks. They had that vigilance in place. But of course, for that to work, centuries have to stay awake, right? Centuries have to not fall asleep on the job. Paul mentioned in the passage with the armor of God, that the armor of God must be worn while in a state of watchfulness. He says, watching all with perseverance. The armor of God is what we need to defeat the devil, defeat evil in this world. But it must be worn. And that verse talks about prayer and watching. It has to be worn with the right mindset of perseverance, of, of vigilance in our life, looking out for those dangers that are coming in. We can't fall asleep on the job can't fall asleep while on watch. We have to be vigilant. We can never let up on our vigilance to keep God foremost in our, mind, in our lives. This is work. And if you say, well, this is too much work to stay on guard that much. Is it too much work to 
get up in the morning and go to work so that you can have a house, you can have a roof over your heads. Is that too much work? Why is it just too much work in the spiritual realm when we put out much more effort in the physical realm? We must have that eternal vigilance if we wish to keep our members free from the bondage to sin. And if we wish to not forget God, we have to have that vigilance vigilance in place to beware. This is how we prevent spiritual amnesia. This is how we prevent becoming a practical atheist. Because when you have forgotten God, you'll become a man who lives his life as if God doesn't exist. Living by your own inventions, by your own wisdom, by your own set of rules, rather than God's. We, the, the great, there's great, great dangers, not only what we discussed, but other ones as well, of forgetting God. So we just covered a few of them. The, the, the dangers of forgetting God, how we forget the purpose of trials, we forget the purpose of blessings. We saw the source of forgetting God, of, of placing value on things that we should not be placing value on. Why would we place value on the physical? You know, we, we heard about the man whose, whose house burned. And, you know, obviously it's a terrible thing and it'd be a great hardship to go through, a great trial to have to go through. But I got news. The Bible says that everything's going to burn. All the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. So it's not just some accident of somebody's house burning. Oh, it's, it's, you know, his house burned down. Everyone's house is going to burn down. Trees are going to, everything's going to burn and melt with fervent heat. So why would we place value on something that is going to burn like that? Misplaced values, the pride that can creep in, thinking that we are the ones who have accomplished the things in our life. So how do we forget it? Bless God. Keep that attitude of thankfulness, that attitude of adoration, and then have that vigilance in place. Beware of the attacks that are coming in to get your mind off of God, to get you to forget God. Forgetting of God will result in the downfall of your life, as, as we saw there in verse 19. And it can happen so insidiously, so gradually. We don't even realize it. It's good every once in a while to stop. And let's say you had just had something happen in your life, a blessing from God. Stop and think. What do I think this blessing is for? Or why do I think I received this blessing? Did I think I received it because it's something that I earned? or because it's a blessing from God. Going through a trial, stop and think, what is my attitude toward this trial? Do I understand that it is for my good? For God's glorification. Brother Farr sitting back here, going through the trial of cancer. And he's he's come up and he's given testimony after testimony of how he's been able to witness to people and, and glorify God because, boom, cancer's gone. And they can't understand it. Think of how much stronger his faith must be for his benefit. God had him go through that, and of course for God's glorification as well. But again, when we have these blessings, maybe we're like Nebuchadnezzar. I've done this. Well, maybe God will have to humble us like he did Nebuchadnezzar. So are we forgetting God in our life today? What is our reaction to trials? What is our reaction to blessings? That, I think, can give us a good idea in our life of whether we have, we're starting to forget God or not. There's great, great danger in forgetting God. Have we developed spiritual amnesia in our lives? All right, let's go ahead and bow our heads. Close our eyes. This message was definitely for those who are Saved, and I, of course, I mentioned I don't see any first-time guests with us, but maybe you've been a member of the church for years and years and years, and you are still struggling with, am I saved? What happens when I die? If you've been in this church for any length of time, you, you've heard Pastor McGovern go through the plan of salvation. And it is so simple, but sometimes it's so difficult to take that first step. And if there's any in here who who would say, I am not sure, I don't know whether I, 
I am going to heaven, whether I am eternally secure. I would invite you, I would love to pray for you, first of all, but I would also invite you to just lift your hand and say, I would, I would like somebody to come and, and to go over this with me. I need to make sure. If there's anyone in here like that, I would invite you, please raise your hand, and we can send somebody to you, and they can take you aside. And again, it, it, it's not going to be a time of embarrassment. We're not, it's, there's not going to be a time of judgment. When you get your eternal destination settled, those who are saved will rejoice with you. Anyone like that at all would say, I'm not sure of my salvation. All right, Christian, have we forgotten God? Israel hath forgotten her maker. Have we forgotten God? America has forgotten God as a nation. It's because God's people started to forget God individually. Let's make sure that it does not happen to us. Lord, we love you so much, and I pray that you just bless. Lord, work on hearts as you see fit. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, grab those song books. We'll sing a song of invitation, 449. If the Lord's done something in your life, and he's trying, to, he's trying to get you to come to this altar and do business, he's worked on your heart, come and do business here at this altar. 449. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Grab me, my Savior, so proud. Amen. We'll go ahead and close.